Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you for being here today. We are hosting a special Digital Futures World event titled New Media Architectures. This topic was inspired by my work within the arts architecture and media arts and my recently completed dissertation titled Shaping Spaces Information, a conceptual framework for new media architectures from the Media Arts and Technology Program at UCSB. I focused my project-based research into three areas, algorithms, world-making, and instrument design, and the hopes of launching a new field of inquiry. Finally, much of my journey was inspired by my advisors, Dr. Joanne Kachera Marin, Marcos Novak, and Marco Pelhan. They challenged my worldview and made me confront the human condition, engaging the limits of the possible, solving problems that required an exploration of engineering, philosophy, and the sciences. I want to thank especially my colleagues in the Allosphere Research Group, led by Dr. Joanne Kuchel Marin, for many insights. Now, how does that research find itself within our world? At the start of the global pandemic, Leonardo Azist had a series of dialogues, and that is where I met Danielle Sambieta and another international art and science community. From that point on, I resolved myself to be a part of a group of dedicated people willing to work at making positive global change. Last summer, after reaching out during an epic set of talks at the Digital Futures World Conference, um, with an email along with a set of questions from YouTube, I felt as though I found new hope. I want to thank Neil Leach and the Digital Futures World family for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, let's begin. Before we start, our presenters are as follows. Uh, Danielle Sambieta, Haru G. Graham Wakefield, Aline Lagarnarsen, Sorry about that. Sholen Keralti, Hannah Wolf, and Wedi Zeng. Our co moderators would be Danielle, myself, and Dr. Sha Jinwei. I will make formal introductions before each presentation. Danielle Sembieta, Dr. Haru G, and Dr. Graham Wakefield. Eileen. Sholen and Hannah, Weidi, Sha Jinwei. New media architectures are the flow, shapes, and spaces as information that redefine our world. Uh, NMA spaces can be qualified for a formalization of space and time while also quantified by computational models that attempt to synthetically mimic complex system behaviors uh, and man-made and, uh, man and or natural spaces. This panel explores the conceptual implications of a new vision for change in contemporary research practice combining arts and sciences. What new agent-based behavior, shape grammars and paradigm of experiences can be discovered? What new collab collaborative forms of art, theory and sciences can be speculated while challenging canonical definitions of the, of the digital and the computational sciences, including artificial intelligence and quantum computation. This panel brings leaders of media arts and computational science researchers together to discuss the state of the arts, humanities, and the sciences. This dialogue builds on a series of past panels that investigate our understanding of the potential of digital futures. These are AI and creativity, interactive design, uh, Zaha code, and many others please go to our YouTube channel and look for immersive robotic environments and towards a hallucination of machines, architecture, artificial intelligence, and indeterminacy. Finally, please go to our Digital Futures World website and click on the events link, Dig Digital Futures World 2021 Inclusive Futures, the schedule for June and July, Digital Consortium Doctoral Platform Inclusive Futures Workshop, and Digital Futures Conference. Now let's go to Danielle. Well, thank you for that introduction, Gustavo. I'm very excited to be here today with all of these really incredible artists and engineers and scientists who I admire and whose work um, some of I've seen in, in, in person and happy to connect virtually. 
Uh, again, my name is Danielle Simbieda. I'm the creative director for Leonardo, the International Society for Art, Sciences, and Technology. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am zooming in from uh, the uh, Roman Tush Ohlone land in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, thank you again for Digital Futures and for Gustavo's leadership in organizing everything today and bringing us together. So uh, I, I was thinking a little bit about this panel and about thinking about a vision for change for the future, because I've been thinking quite a bit about how we can really bring everybody together over this, especially this past year. But it also brought me back to why I really got into working in uh, this area of art and science or new media to begin with. And it wasn't that I was started really this journey where I went from my undergraduate to my graduate school and I said, okay, I'm going to work in um, this digital computation spectrum and I'm going to be doing this research in this particular way. It really came out of um, a place of, of, um, of worry and, and frustration and um, feeling lost and feeling lonely uh, and um, really upset about how the the government was handling things and how people were responding to things or how apathy was was really plaguing the world. I, I really um, started to go down this path uh, as, as a response of, of being really apolitical or very um, not really not really um, wanting to participate in anything really. And um, my, my former life, I was a, a community organizer. Um, in South Central Los Angeles and in Missouri and in San Diego, working with quite a few diverse communities um, on issues that, that meant a lot to them, like things like community policing and affordable housing and things against predatory lending or um, environmental justice issues. And I was frustrated over and over again by the response of, of the way that our systems were set up. And uh, I, yeah, at one point, I, I just sort of said, you know, I need to I need to stop this and and just you know re rethink where I'm where I'm going, what I'm doing. And I I did this book called The Artist Way. And for some of you who are um, really creative makers and have gone down this path, you'll know what I'm talking about. It it really was very helpful. Called the Twelve Step um, Program Back to Your Creative Center. Um, anyway, so I I I just started to decided to I, okay, I want to focus on on making and seeing where that goes. And I'm, I'm gonna center myself in this space and, and just create and make, and I'm not going to, to let any agenda follow me. Um, and that led me into uh, the Silicon Valley to a, a small program at a San Jose State College or the, called the Cadre Laboratory for New Media. And I actually, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is, is that there was a talk the other day by the, the founder of that program and my mentor, Joel Slayton, who um, was sharing the history of that program again to me, which I had somehow forgotten. It's the second oldest program, new media program in the entire country and had some of the first computer art uh, ever collected at the, at the Whitney. And there was, um, I, I remember going into um, his office and saying, well, I, I know that I'm not really uh, a, the best artist. I, I, I don't, I'm not the best painter and I'm not the best uh, uh, sculptor. And uh, I, here's my portfolio. And he says, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I, I just don't want to not be myself. I said, I just want to be who I am and, and not try to hide all these characteristics about myself. And um, that was the first time I actually was honest with myself about that. It's the first time I said to myself that I did not want to um, try to mold myself into somebody else's figure somebody else's shape so he says well what, what do you want to do I said well you know I, I'm just naturally going to be a, a leader and, and and I know some people may not want that and it's just it's it's, it's just going to come out it's just going to be natural and I, I I can't stop that and um I'm a creative person and my last pr prior to that my last uh employer had uh, full-time employer had said um, that they didn't want creative people out there at their work. I remember him saying specifically, it was at this uh, community organization, 
saying that we don't want creative people. We'll put you in a box because we don't want creative people. And, I, and that that's really actually what broke it. That's what broke the straw. And um, I said, you know, I am a creative person and I can't be put into a box. There's, those are two things I just cannot do. And, and, and then I said something very idealistic and very, um, you know, at the, at the time so sounds very green. And I even said, I said, I, I, I just really want to save the world. I just really want to make this planet a better place. And, um, and, 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 and he's, and I said, okay, do you want to see my portfolio? He goes, no, I don't need to see your portfolio. You're in. And I, I thought that was really weird. I just got into an art program without a portfolio. And I just said these, I just basically said what I'm, what I am is I'm honest about who I am. I'm not talking about my artistic process and how I'm, um, you know, making these, these same painting studies 20 dozen over again. Um, that was a really strange feeling going into an art program. And what I, what I didn't realize then, what I'm realizing now is that this is where art and science is. And this is where a lot of the um, researchers, the creators, the people who come into Leonardo, come into um, this call, come into the community, are coming in because they're they're actually trying to make the world a better place. They're trying to to really um, connect people together and um, look at some of the world's most complex complex and wicked problems and see what are the pathways and how to solve that and how do we bring people together to make that happen and, and actually doing experimentations and really pushing those boundaries. And and um, and really uh, making that making sure that space and that time happens, and that's really my goal. Um, I, I I really wear two hats in this space. So uh, as an artist, I call myself an alter eco artist, uh, meaning that I feel like I sit between somewhere between eco art because a lot of the work that I do is environmental focused, spe specifically on things like. Uh, green energy, uh, en renewable energy, life cycle engineering, uh, materials, um, things that are really looking at the um, the software systems, the way that we actually understand climate science, uh, and and a lot of other things that are around that spectrum, and then and then digital art, uh, because I do work mostly on the on the things that really hacking of the technology, right? Looking at um, things that are either computational or maker-based, fabrication-based, but really, I'm not. I'm not really a, a representational eco artist or a land artist, or nor am I a um, a gamer. Somebody who works in that space or or works in data visualization. So I that's where I position myself. And I'll talk in a minute a little bit about um, some of the work that, that I've done in the past, but I spent um, a lot of time, mostly as my time as an eco artist, kind of going in two directions. And one is looking at how do you lower the carbon footprint of art making? And that really is looking at the art economy, the life cycle of art making, um, really looking from manufacturing and retailing to consumption to practice and how do we actually bring in new supply, look at innovation and change that spectrum. Uh, I've done that for over a decade. And then um, looking at the other area, which is um, around um, concept and speculative architecture, uh, looking at how do we look at shelter uh, and um, sustainable um, spaces and, and, and looking at competitions that the Land Art Generator Initiative has put together, or one that I managed for quite some time called the San Jose Climate Clock Initiative. Um, and then with Leonardo, on the other hand, this is really our, our, our main intention as an organization is to look at those, the, those complex issues that are happening around the world and think and look at us as a think tank, uh, how we can apply creativity uh, to actually, uh, through art, science and technology to address those systems, to make a better future for all. And that's a really important um, space in, in, in that, in that uh, area. And I wanna really emphasize that creating a better future for all is um, really critical and, and very important to where we are as an organization and how we wanna bring everyone together. 
I realize that I'm, I'm out of time and I'm going to um, really just help guide this more in moderation, uh, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear everyone who is on this call share their brilliance, their ideas, and how we can connect together and work together um, to, to really achieve the mission and, and, and the heart that comes from you and from everyone out there in the audience who's, who's viewing this today. So thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Danielle. Uh, <clears throat> and now uh, the next presenters are uh, um, Haru and um, Graham. So let me let me, when they while get the, while they set up, let me actually make the transition. Uh, Dr. Haru G is a media artist and co-creator of a research pro uh, project, Artificial Natures, exploring artificial life world making. She holds a PhD in the media arts and technology from UCSB and is an assistant professor at uh, DPXA and the Digital Futures programs at OCAD University at Toronto, Canada. Her work has been shown in art festivals, conferences, and venues, including Seagraph, ICEA, EVO Workshops, La, La Gaite Lyrique, ZKM, CAFA, MOXI, the Allosphere, Seoul City Hall, and recognized in the two, 2015 Viva Art and Artificial Life. Dr. Graham Wakefield is an artist researcher and a software developer exploring the liveness of computation across the immersive media and co-creator of Artificial Natures as an associate professor in computational arts and, and Canada research chair in computational world making. He directs the Alice Lab at York University. He holds a BA in philosophy from the University of Warwick, a master's of composition from Goldsmiths College University of London and a PhD in the media arts and technology from UCSB. And he has written widely used media art software such as Gen for Cycling 74 and Max. They will speak about artificial natures. Uh, take it away, Graham and Haru. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this intriguing discussions and communities. We are very excited to um, uh, for uh, our future dialogues and collaborations. Uh, we began to form um, a media art group named Artificial Nature and have collaborated creating Artificial Natures since 2007. Our approach to the theme of this uh, panel, this new media architectures, begins from um, our non-hierarchical, non-presumptive, flat ontology between human, non-human, and man-made beings, as well as between virtual and physical realities. We also begin from a principle of what we call endogeny, which, in which lively change and value and creation come from the interrelations from within. And from here, several common attributes of our artificial natures follow. First, this is an interactive systems art, especially seeking for infinite feedback, such as we can find from any living ecosystem and the surroundings in nature. Uh, second, we aim to realize shared realities to bring non-human perspectives and to emphasize the overlapping surroundings between natural and artificial beings. And finally, we're working on non-mainstream approaches to creative artificial intelligence concerned with our wild and untamed future. And we'd like to flesh some of these ideas out by introducing a few of our works. Uh, this is Time of Doubles, one of the artificial nature realizations um, in 2011 at the Seoul Olympic Museum of Art in South Korea. This installation realizes the coexistence of multiple doubles in mirrored worlds, in which organisms grow and adapt to an environment in part shaped by you, where your body influences currents of the wind while your virtual self is consumed by creatures. It is important to us that the complex network of feedback relations in the world surrounds the visitor in display and interaction. It brings the generative capacity of computation into an experiential level comparable to the open-endedness of the natural world. We use continuous and indirect modes of interaction where possible, preferring multimodal by direction uh, by directionality over symbolic cause and effect. So there's no beginning or end, no center or privileged position, but there remain continuous changes, processes, and organizations. Our next work, Andrew's Current, adapted to both immersive installations and VR experiences. 
So the artificial life forms here subsist within a simulated 3D fluid environment that is constrained by an amorphous landscape reminiscent of underwater or microscopic spaces. And uh, here we can illustrate our principle of endogeny through this dynamic complex network of feedback relations. So for example, the particles here aren't the surface kinds of effects that you'd see in a video game. You can follow each one as it gains or loses structural energy or integrity, even follows it's being digested within an organism and then ejected out of it or, or by another species. So nothing here is static. Every element has got multiple influences with every other element. Uh, and it's really important to us that there's no dead ends, where meaning emerges from these interrelations rather than being semiotic symbols. Our next work is Archipelago. Here we focus on the use of mixed reality as a method of shared, playful, and open-ended complexity in hybrid space between human and non-human beings. So its bestiary contains this pulsating lichen that sustains several species of moving organisms, displaying foraging, scavenging, predatory and social behaviours like swarming, nesting and pheromone trail marking. And as visitors reach down and touch the land, they can discover these alien creatures creeping onto their hands. And, and then they'll be able to lift these creatures up and carefully transport them to deposit into other regions or new islands that they've made, uh, or to the destruction. Your shadow destroys the vegetation underneath. You became a force of death, but also rebirth. The desolation is followed by greater fertility, but you are not a mighty god here. Um, interaction is nuanced in response, but your influence is limited. Archipelago evolved to Inhabitat in 2017 at the Children's Science Museum and was visited by 65,000 visitors over five months. Its world awaits playful engagement through three distinct ways to see with other eyes. A macro scale, super personal perspective over the whole sculpture, a meso scale view through the eyes of the creature, and a micro scale, first person perspective in virtual reality. Uh, in 2000, um, 2018 summer, the island became many worlds of inspiration. Here, again, we focused on plural views. Shared surroundings as umbrellas are experienced at different scales of space and time. We are bringing this possible alien world so that we can alienate ourselves first. In these alien worlds, can you become playful? Can artificial beings be curious and playful with us? Our next work, Conservation of Shadows, focuses on shared realities with site specificity. Uh, Selma Chango is a, recent, a recently acquired expansion of the Seoul Museum of Art within the former grounds of the Korea Center for Disease Control. Our work responds to this very specific history of the host venue through a central conception of shadows as shared physical images between visible and visual, invisible worlds. A softly ringing motor actuated miniature bells Surround the, uh, surround the installation space, hanging down from the rafters at different locations and heights, varying in intensity and creating a variegated spatial sonic experience whenever invisible beings pass by. The shadows of these invisible beings mix with our own shadows on the salt bed underfoot. By donning a head-mounted display, visitors take on an alternative perspective to witness a world coexisting in superposition. And what first appeared as flat shadows on the salt are unveiled to be alien creatures moving around and through our now shadowy bodies and responding to our movements and gestures. And um, you can also sense the shadow volumes of other people as they visit the space too. It's a little bit like the feeling of knowing someone's with you in a, in a, in a dark room. Oops. Finally, our most recent work, Infranet, brought new materials to our practice. Infranet combines real-world open data resources with evolutionary neural networks and extends the space of its complex adaptive system to the scale of a city. This work starts with the question, do we know what intelligence is? And if we don't know, how can we approach it? Our hypothesis to this was that intelligence is a phenomenon of cognition in general as an embedded condition for all living systems. 
Each exhibit of Infranet utilizes public data available on the host city, including Gwangju, South Korea, Vancouver, Canada, and New York, USA. None of the source data is itself directly displayed, uh, and it's not being used to answer a question or, or answer a question. Um, rather, within this landscape of city data, thousands of artificial creatures are born, dwell, and die. And what we see are the traces and the trails that these creatures leave in space as they draw out their particular umbelts. Each one has an antenna to read and metabolize the underlying data, but these senses are limited. They cannot read all channels, but rather have a personal taste or bias that filters most of the data out, as if for any particular creature, the majority of the data just doesn't exist. Each creature also has a unique neural network that is dynamic in both weights and architecture. They're excitable, they're sociable, they're curious. The creatures change their neural architectures every few chirps by mimicking those of their near neighbors. This is like the continuous genetic exchange of a bacterial quasi-species or the contagious transfer of ideas. And as the creatures move, their society forms a much larger second order neural network of ever shifting structure where ideas can move in pattern waves through the whole. The color of trails and folds left behind represent their current taste, revealing the kinships. Thinner trails are more deeply ingrained than softer folds, a kind of long-term memory that gradually desaturates and then evaporates, revealing how creatures have discovered the city. This is not evolution under some intense selective pressure because we're not solving a pre-given problem and because pressure can choke creativity. Their only condition of survival is a measure of well-being as expressed by two intrinsic motivations, to find data and to find trails. That is, a primal need to verify that the world exists and to, the, to know that one is not alone in it. Rather, there's a drive towards diversity. Creatures with lower well-being are more likely to mimic the neural networks of their neighbors, especially if their neighbor's taste is different. Um, creature perceptions are also like neural spike trains and attempt to synchronize with their nearest neighbors, like flashing fireflies. Since the spikes make them move, the neighborhood changes and the perceptions never stabilize. Instead, linear, circular, and spiral waves can be seen in the population. Uh, more recently, we found that there's a remarkable synergy between this kind of system and some models of non-conscious cognition in biological brains. Um, here is a secondary visualization of watchers. Each watcher follows a creature as it moves through the data, displaying data about the creature's current state and dissimilarity to their neighbors. The watcher is a seeker of difference, a bio CCTV. The original intention of the watcher system was as, um, as a regulator or immune response mechanism to subvert stagnant monocultures. However, once simulations um, started to run, we did not observe stagnation or over-centralization. The inhabitants appeared to create ever-changing patterns without converging. Um, this is an example of working with machines for collective creativity beyond our expectations of revealing what we didn't know, we think. A slide. <laughs> Um, AI and new media are smearing to all aspects of life, into what Catherine Hales has described as planetary cognitive ecology. And we're cautious about static performance measures and assumptions, such as used by uh, supervised AIs, that can only predict what is already known. We're cautious of the risk in working with the low hanging fruit of available data, the readily measurable properties, the known structures, etc., as exploiting too soon and thus over-determining available paths of action and limiting futures. We don't want to live in a future that's already paid by the past. Instead, we see creativity as oriented to an open future, producing new qualities through intrinsic motivations while enlightening the unknown. Um, again, thinking of planetary cognitive ecology, this points away from optimization toward anti-fragility. Almost all the Earth's biomass is now in service to humans. We have reduced the wild unknown to pockets and islands. Um, directly or indirect, uh, indirectly, we displace anything we can't measure or make use of, even without knowing what it might be. 
Despite the fact that optimization leads to vulnerability, we hope that a better understanding of creativity and complex variety beyond the human century may point again to qualities of the wild. Perhaps living with the artificial natures can bring us to the wild too. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. G and Dr. Wakefield. I, every time I see you guys, I'm completely awestruck. Um, I can't really say how much I have learned from you guys. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, our next speaker is um, Eline Lar uh, Larganissen. So sorry, Le you can say it again. Yeah, from the Interactive Eline Architecture. Garnison. Okay, good. Okay, so let me, <laughs> let me read your bio while you get set up. Okay, uh, as a designer and experiential artist, Eline strives to create experiences sparking curiosity, exploration, and movement. Her work sits at the intersection between humans and environments, physical and digital, sensuality and systems. She creates VR, AR, XR experiences, installation art, as well as interior designs. Her latest piece, Unbalanced, was exhibited and published throughout Europe and awarded the, the 2020 Lumens XR Award. Coming from the island of La Reunion, she mm -hmm. has seven years of experience in spatial and interaction uh, design intertwined with eight years of design studies. These were concluded by an MARC at the Interaction Architectures Lab designed for performance and interaction from the Bartlett UCL London. Uh, take it away. Thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited um, to be uh, sharing this conference with all of you guys. Um, so let me uh, just put this on. Let me just share my screen. There we go. So um, I am here to tell you about body movement and awareness in immersive experiences. And I'm going to do so through um, presenting you my work and balance and the process that led me to it. So um, one quote um, that really inspired my work is uh, one by Eccleston, which reads, body sensations greatly contribute to our minds being embodied and embedded in the world. It is how we experience our bodies and how our bodies experience the world. So being aware about this um, and knowing that uh, it is, um, we are more and more aware uh, today in our Western world of the importance of body awareness and body movement for our physical and mental health. I've been looking at our everyday interactions and spatial contexts only to see that um, it mainly limits and control our bodies as well as disperse our, um, as well as dispersing our everyday attention. So from this, I thought, uh, how could we imagine then human space interactions for grounding the notion of embodiment? And also how could we imagine human space interactions training curiosity, exploration and awareness rather than efficiency? Through uh, my research, um, I stumbled upon the somaesthetics theory, uh, which became a big part of my work. This theory highlights the uh, links between ampl amplifying sensory perception, learning body awareness, and moving in unusual ways. So from there, I thought, okay, so then how can we create experiences which, and can we, and create experiences which would push people to move in unusual ways through amplifying sensory perception. Um, there is a video there coming. Yeah. Um, so my first, um, my very initial explorations were um, looking at shifting body perception uh, through adding weights on different parts of the body, as well as shifting body perception through um, virtual avatar. Uh, which was um, distorting my own body. Um, and finally, um, looking at shifting world perception through illusions of verticality in VR and XR. And through those, exp those um, experimentations, 
um, I um, found that the node uh, really to our the perception of our body, the, perce the perception of the world, and especially um, the perception of the moving body uh, in the world is really balanced, as it is balanced that we are constantly negotiating as we are moving um, through the world. Um, so I decided um, to play um, on this notion and see what would happen. My first prototype uh, was looking at shifting the perception of the world in XR. It was doing so through a tilting cushioned uh, platform and um, immersing the participant into a VR experience where the horizon would be shifting uh, as the tilted, as the platform tilted as well um, as um, changing uh, the gravity of the world and having particles um, attracted in different directions. Um, doing um, uh, some initial tests with this, I realized that the participants were mainly um, moving the lower part uh, of their body um, in this experience. And I thought, okay, so um, balance is really really more about the access between the head and the part of the body. Um, this is how um, I started looking at uh, sensory augmentation apparels, um, placing different tubes on different locations of the body, which were filled with um, very heavy beads. So it's lead beads, the same material that you'd use to go um, deep diving. Um, I worked with the dancer Tia Hockey, um, to see how um, the different locations of the body, the different materials of the tubes, and were creating different, um, more or less linear responses to her movements, and how this was triggering, um, encouraging um, different forms uh, of movement, different speeds, and different forces. Um, this worked really well on her, um, but uh, trying it out on just uh, our regular audience and everyday people, I realized that people were getting a bit of a stage fright um, and moving a lot less than in my initial prototype. Um, so this is how um, I um, ended up with uh, my prototype three, uh, which was shifting perception of the body and the world through physical and virtual sensory augmentation. So this combines one uh, of the apparels we just discussed, um, with the tilting platform, as well uh, as a VR experience where the body is emitting particles, which are getting attracted um, in different directions, depending on the uh, movements of the upper body, so the head to hips axis, as well as the tilts of the platform. Um, this was exhibited at um, Ars Electronica, um, and uh, I got uh, loads of people to play with it, and uh, it really got me to understand that um, well, um, this really seemed to work as every kind of people really naturally uh, started getting very uh, curious and really started to explore movement and completely forget about um, anyone um, around them and just started to move in very unusual ways, uh, which was um, what I set up to create. Um, so it is this the prototype um, that I um, developed in um, Unbalance, uh, which uh, you can see a bit um, of the uh, teaser there. So Unbalance is a 10 minutes solo experience where players are invited to play on the edge of stability. VR technology is combined to two analog tools, a wearable and a tilting platform. They merge into visual, touch, and sound stimuli, augmenting the player's perception of her body and environment. So I'm going to look just a little bit uh, into more detail um, into um, the um, development of the um, elements of this experience. Um, so first, we have the platform where um, I found that adding a Auditory um, feedback there uh, was really useful too. Um, to, um, so uh, I added those um, lead beads tubes. And then we have the apparel, which uses neoprene so that it can really um, allow um, the participant to move while holding the weight of the beads. Um, it, is, it combines different materials of tubes so that we uh, combine um, different um, more or less uh, linear 
uh, responses um, to the participant um, movement. And then finally, uh, we have, I'm not going to have there, sorry. We go back, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Um, yay. Um, apologies for that. Uh, um, so uh, let me just uh, tell you through it. Um, so the um, uh, the um, the VR experience is using um, very muted shades of gray so that it would keep the visual stimuli in balance with other stimuli, so auditory and haptic. Um, and finally, uh, the uh, experience evolves uh, through time, getting the player's awareness to flow between her body and um, the environment. The, um, in, in the play of multi-sensory stimuli enhanced by nonlinear responses awakens the player's curiosity, made unusually aware of body and environment she's provoked to engage in a truly exploratory process through movement, <clears throat> uh, which I am um, currently um, developing into a collective um, experience, so a multi-sensory playground, looking at how um, I could uh, use, uh, so not using VR, but still um, using a form of XR where there are screens and beads, um, visible beads uh, within those uh, platforms and how um, this, uh, uh, how I could get people to move together and be aware of their bodies and environments together uh, rather than a solo experience. And this is it for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aline, for your presentation. Um, I have to say, I met you uh, on a project with uh, Lumens and Leonardo uh, making mm -hmm. um, an exhibition. And I remember the first time I met you, I think on Zoom, I was like, whoa. Um, but uh, your work is inspirational. And I really, I really appreciate your attention to detail and you have fans and the Digital Futures family. So I'm sure they'll reveal themselves soon, but thank you, thank you very much for coming. Um, That's great to hear, thank you for having <laughs> me. Really. Yes, thank you. Our next speakers are um, Dr. Sholen Kiratli and Dr. Hannah E. Wolf. And I'll make formal introductions before they start. Uh, uh, Dr. Sholen Kiralti is an artist, architect, researcher, and lecturer. Her work is interdisciplinary and deals with issues of agency and digital technology, including machinic, organic, and hybrid agents. In her artwork, she uses a variety of media, including sound and digital audio, interactive and physical computing, machine learning and robotics, and digital design and fabrication. Her work has been exhibited at many international venues such as Seagraph, Seagraph Asia, ISEA, Currents, New Media, Contemporary Istanbul, and Naim. She is a recipient of several awards from renowned institutions, including Seagraph, Best of Show 2020, and Fundación Telefónica, Vida 13, Artistic Production Incentives. Uh, Dr. Hannah Wolf and is Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Colby College. She earned a PhD in Media Arts and Technology in 2019 and an MS in Computer Science in 2017 from UCSB, as well as a BA in Visual Arts from Bennington College. Uh, her work has been shown at Isaiah, Naim, and Kai. Her artwork focuses on the relationship between body uh, and technology, giving computers and robotics uh, biological qualities. They will be discussing a cacophonic choir, and I am glad to know my colleagues and take it away. Hi, thank you, Gustavo, for that introduction. Um, today, uh, Sholen and I will be talking about Cacophonic Choir. Cacophonic Choir is an interactive sound installation aimed at bringing attention to firsthand stories of sexual assault survivors and the way such stories may be distorted by the media and online discourse. 
Hackathon at Choir is composed of multiple agents distributed in space that each tell a story. From afar, their utterances are heard as an incoherent cloud of murmurs, and as the visual appro visitor approaches an agent, it responds by becoming more visually bright, semantically coherent, and sonically clear, thereby revealing the original anonymous testimony of a sexual assault survivor. This collaboration is Sorry, this work is a collaboration between myself, Sholen, and Alex Bundy, a musician and software engineer based in Santa Barbara. And I, th I thought I would start by showing a video of this work. She started touching. So I noticed he was on my eye told my best friend and how I was scared to say anything. He got into trouble as I knew I put my hand in my vagina and still scared that time. Friend and then she started telling me things. For who is that one you or sat then there was a death supposes against women you report sexual attack he said that yes. then there uh, was a death support no, no, say struggle expresses an acid way but even today with the courage to be so angry that surviving rapist lives in my neighborhood is that one you or me just decided to hire his friend he seemed like a cool He was laughing at me and telling me he wanted to play He told me to get out of the bar of number a few days later, since I was trying to process what happened, it messed me up. I trusted her. So I will take from here. Um, hi, my name is Shoyan Krapa. Thanks all so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this project. Um, and when hashtag MeToo started happening and women started coming forth to share their experiences, there was a lot of support and empowerment, but there was also a lot of backlash too. Um, so, so many voices, um, negative and positive, supportive and hostile. Um, and as researchers, we were already dealing with uh, sonic interaction design, um, and we wanted to do something about this, these voices. Um, and as survivors of sexual assaults ourselves, we both felt empowered, but at the same time overwhelmed in this climate. Um, empowerment for the people who come forth is good, death threats and hate emails, not so good. Um, it is very painful to come forth and talk about your trauma, as many sexual assault survivors would no, um, you face disbelief or straight up hostility. And there is a, there's quite a bit of research about this as well. For example, um, a study in 2018 uh, found that between Twitter users who engage in victim blaming and those who support sexual assault survivors, those who blame victims get retweeted more. Uh, so social, social media can be toxic. Um, so we wanted to reflect this situation, this double-edged sword, if you will. Um, social technologies are great, but they can also be toxic. Coming forth is great, but then it comes with its price. Uh, rape is a systematic problem, but it happens to individuals and each story is important. Uh, so our goals were to, uh, to give agency to the voices of those who survived sexual assault um, and to critique online and mass media as a social platform. Uh, so we wanted to present stories of sexual violence, both as individual stories and as a larger societal problem, expressing how media discourse affects sexual assault survivors, both empowering and overwhelming them. 
um, how should these agents express these voices? Uh, the problem here, we thought, is that there is a gap between the original story as told by the survivor and the way it is distorted, twisted, and turned um, in various media outlets. Um, distortion itself is also mediated by the same technologies that empower people. Uh, misinformation and hateful remarks are easily amplified and spread, as we all know. So going back to the gap between the original story as told by the survivor and the way it's distorted, we decided to somehow reflect this gap as an actual physical distance in space that impacts people's narratives. In other words, what if we use a physical distance between the agent and the viewer, that is the narrator and the listener, um, as a metaphor for the distance or accuracy between the original story and its coverage? And here, go back to Hannah. So for this piece, we developed software that modulates the linguistic and auditory coherence of these narratives based on the proximity of the observer and narrator, as Shalin just described. In other words, the arrangement of words become less meaningful at a distance and more coherent when approached. Sonically, we do this in two different ways. The first is text generation. To do this, we trained a neural network to generate emotionally charged text from firsthand occults accounts of sexual assault survivors at different linguistic levels of clarity. And we did this by training it for different lengths of time to represent more clear text. The second form is sound processing, which was a granular processing of the audio, rendering the speech from stuttery to clear, making the agent sound more hesitant and uh, nervous at a further distance. And then last, we modulated the light source based on the participant's distance, rendering the form within it visible due to the translucent membrane. So to express how the stories of sexual assault are filtered through the news media, as we said before, the story each agent tells is controlled by the vis distance of visitors from the agent. When a participant is more than two meters away, the agent randomly chooses words from a testimonial of a sexual assault survivor, which is assigned to it. As the participant approaches, the words become less coherent, less random and more coherent. To generate text, a long short-term memory LSTM recurrent neural network model was pre-trained on over 500 stories of experiences of sexual assault from the When You're Ready Project website. For the final installation, we pre-generated text for 65 of the testimonials at each level of semantic clarity using models trained for longer periods of time to represent closer distances with a greater number of words from the original text as a seed. Once the visitor is less than half a meter away in the agent's personal space, the agent tells its original testimonial. And to show one. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, for, for the uh, sound design, which is what I'm going to talk about right now, we collaborated with, um, like, like we said before, Alex Bundy. Um, and um, so in addition to applying semantic processing to these stories that we took from a, um, a, um, an online platform, um, audio processing is applied to these voices uh, to create a stuttering and halting effect that increases the further the weaver is away from the agent. Um, this effect is meant to reflect both um, the distortion of media representations of sexual assault and the fear and self-doubt sexual assault survivors may feel in the face of those representations. Um, granular processing is used to achieve this effect. Um, some pheno phonemes um, in the sound files were randomly repeated or skipped with the odds of a skip of, um, or repeat increasing as the viewer's distance from the work has increased. And we used um, text-to-speech synthesis to achieve this. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So um, the third important element of this piece, obviously, is the visual design and the visual response. Um, the agent's morphology consists of the interface elements, uh, along with the parametrically designed and digitally fabricated sculptural form all encased within a soft translucent silicone-based membrane. Uh, the design of the visual response follows a similar concept as 
the semantic and sonic responses. Um, as the visitor approaches, the LED ring within the membrane gets brighter and this renders the white translucent membrane gradually more and more transparent, revealing the intricate geometric form within. Um, these are parametric variations of the same form generated in Grasshopper 3D and digitally fabricated uh, using 3D printing. Um, some of these forms are fully embedded in the membrane while others burst uh, through in varying degrees. Um, and here we wanted to reflect two things. Uh, first is to reflect the condition that the individuals and their voices may look and sound alike from a distance, but each is indeed rather complex and unique. Um, and we try to achieve this through parametric variations and also containing some of these forms fully within the membrane and having others burst outwards as one we can see in the pictures. Um, the second is to reflect, our second goal was to reflect the inherent tension in the public coverage of private events since opaqueness and transparency have strong connotations in privacy and publicness in many cultures. Um, and uh, light modulation uh, with the property of the translucent material um, along with the um, design of the geometry enabled this. Yeah, so this work was exhibited at Contemporary Istanbul's plug-in exhibition in September of 2019. Initially, we were worried that the space we were given was not isolated sonically enough from other works, but it caused an interesting unintended interaction between the visitors and the work. To hear the stories clearly, visitors had to be close to a specific agent and place their ears directly next to it like it was whispering to them, creating a level of intimacy between the agent and the visitor. We, we built a virtual installation of this work using Unity and exhibited it this summer at SIGGRAPH and IEEE VizApp. The virtual version can be experienced online in the browser at cacophonic.net. A virtual environment removes aspects of the experience that physical presence provides, but also creates different affordances, for example, increasing the accuracy of measuring proximity and removing physical limitations like the need for pedestals. Future, future virtual versions of the work could allow for increased numbers of agents, increased scale of the objects to allow visitors to be inside them. And we will continue exhibiting this work both digitally and physically and plan to study the differences in the way that visitors interact with the work both virtually and in person. So then I thought we'd talk just for a second, uh, both Shalen and I, a little bit about our own work um, or our separate work. So one work that I've been doing in collaboration with Sahar Sajadeh is Come Hither to Me, an interactive robotic performance piece, which examines the emotional, um, emotive social interaction between audience and a robot. Our interactive intelligent robot attempts to communicate and flirt with audience members in the gallery space while inverting gender roles and stereotypical expectations in flirtatious interactions, it explores the objectification of women and the gamification of, of seduction. Um, and then another work that I've done is a uh, touching effectivity, an art installation using a small furry creature which sonifies the way it's touched. This creature experiences its world through conductive fur a sensor which can detect different types of touch like scratching, petting, and tickling. Aspects of the conductive fur signal like frequency, intensity, and signal variance affect the speed, volume, filters, and timbre of the synthesized sound. And it also responds haptically through vibration. So here's a, oh. Here's a short video.
So um, I'll pass it off to Sholen. Sorry about that. Here I am back again. Uh, my work deals with issues of agency and digital technology, dealing with both machinic and organic agents. Um, I have to say that I'm trained both in architecture and media arts. Uh, that is, I think, really reflected in my work. Uh, so due to my training in architecture, I'm concerned with space and materiality and how spaces and objects may relate to one's body. And due to my training in media arts, I'm concerned with technology agency and agents. And agency is, uh, uh, of course, capacity to act, and agents are spaces and things uh, with that capacity. Uh, so in the case of my work, this capacity is manifested primarily uh, via the so sound medium. Uh, so the pri two primary elements in my work are sound voices, um, that is the ways in which various technologies may help or hinder the agency to those in stress, amplifying and mediating their voices and utterances. And the second primary element is material, materiality and architectures. And with that, I focus on physical and material mean, uh, ways in which such agents may be embodied use, using digital design and fabrication. So the work I uh, chose to present here, since we have very limited amount of time, is um, titled Hive. Uh, it's a result of a collaboration with Akshay Kadambi and Retouch Lab. Um, it's an interactive installation um, exploring the notion of sentience and agency in the sonic medium. Uh, we conceived of Hive as a speculative organism that belongs to a family of organisms whose subjective worlds, umwelts, uh, consist only of sound signals. Um, in other words, their only mode of sensing and responding to their environments um, is through sound. Um, by restricting this speculative creature's perception and action mechanisms to a mere sonic modality, we aimed at emphasizing the importance of sonic communication for the survival of many species and how soundscape as a finite resource is neglected by humans and consumed and contaminated as a result of our activities. Um, so yeah, I think that's all for now for me. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, you guys. Uh, thank you, Sholen, uh, Dr. Kiralti, and Dr. Wolf. Uh, I have to say that uh, over the years, uh, you both have inspired me in my journey, but I also wanted to be very clear um, the work that you presented is very profound right now at this time. And I am a supporter of the work and I hope that uh, we can add more light to our social problems and hopefully be agents of change. And I would love to speak with you more at the Q&A about that, but thank you very much. Uh, now to our next presenter, um, Wadi Zhang. And before she, while she gets start, uh, set up, I will do a formal introduction. So um, Wadi Zhang is an LA-based new media artist, visual designer, and researcher. Her current research in media arts practices investigate the possibilities of semantic meanings and non-linear narrativity of assemblage art in the context of intelligent systems design and interactive generative art. Her works are featured at different venues internationally, such as Seagraph, Isaiah, Times Art Museum, Swiss Next Gallery, her artwork is juried, uh, selected uh, in Japan media art festivals and honorable mentions in Lumens Prize. Currently, she is a PhD candidate at the Media Arts and Technology Program and a researcher in Experimental Visualization Lab at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She holds an MFA degree from Art and Technology at the California Institute of the Arts, and that is my alma mater as well. So Wadey, you're one of my favorites, take it away. Okay, so I'm gonna share my uh, screen. Um, thank you, Gustavo, for introducing me and thank you for having me here in this great uh, presentations. And today I'm very excited to share with you guys um, some of my creative practices relates to the, my research topic, a new assemblage. 
So I was born and raised in China, a historical city, Suzhou. And that city is renowned for its unique architecture style of Chinese gardens. And it not only have those kind of traditional historical Chinese gardens, it also a, a prosper economic developing city. So it has modern architectures. So the city, my hometown itself for me is an assemblage. And I was growing up in those kind of Chinese gardens environments. And when I looking closer to those gardens, I noticed that there's always a very exquisite uh, window on the walls and on, in, on the doors. It kind of incorporate the distant views, distant landscape, and also the views inside of these gardens into the current composition. And it's actually one of the Chinese garden design strategy for our scenery. So that deeply inspired me to observe my surroundings with multiple layers. And I always pay extra attention to the connectivity between different layers. So when I look in closer to the assemblage theory, it's actually uh, bring up by Deleuze and Guattari, originally represented in the Broco Southern Platters. And also in our field, um, the assemblage of art was firstly, first time marked um, in um, the, assembly, the Art of Assemblage, MoMA Art Exhibition, 60 years ago, curated by William Sess. And he um, kind of refined the definition of assemblage in order to cover all forms of composite arts and modes of juxtaposition. And um, the assemblage techniques is not only used <clears throat> in the art making process, it also used in the literature, for example, cut up techniques by William Barr's The Great Nikkei Lounge, and also in music fields, um, the music concord in the 20th century, and also spatial collage in the style by uh, Kurt Schroeder. And this is <clears throat> ever expanding uh, spatial collage. So I was really fascinated by those kind of um, 20th century assemblage uh, practices, and I was trying to reformulate the concept of assemblage within an AI and interactive art context via the following question. So who will be the creator of this new assemblage? Machines or the audiences or the artists or the equal contributions from the three sides? Um, secondly, I connect, uh, I really concern the connectivity between the layers and the parts because image classification and image generation and also the real-time feedback from the audiences really affect the connectivity as well as um, the transcend choice operations and also matters and forms the data transformation, uh, signal processing techniques from the engineering field offers a great possibility for new materials. I also want to emphasize one important component in all of my creative practices is the real-time configurations. I got inspiration from uh, this famous quote, everything flows and nothing abides, everything gives away and nothing stays fixed. You cannot step twice into the same river for other water just continuously uh, flowing out, it is in changing that things find repose. So um, in the past few years, I was doing a practice-based um, research on this topic, and I create several virtual reality experiences. For example, uh, this one using found materials from 1980s Chinese posters and to reconstruct the space by using those found materials. And this is some virtual reality art installation was exhibited in Times Square Museum in Beijing. And I also created another um, virtual reality experience by using over 50,000 images. I took uh, both in my hometown, Suzhou, and also in uh, the places I'm currently living in Los Angeles. So I was trying to create an autobiographical uh, experience that reconstruct my cultural identity. Um, I also doing some audio immersive audio visual performance and by creating those visuals, machine generated visuals and algorithmic design. And those uh, visuals, is, uh, those performance was exhibited in a dome format in Russia uh, recently. So um, in a few, uh, in the recent two years, I began to interested in non-human narrators. So one of the work I did is uh, a VR exploration navigated by AI system. It's in collaboration with my uh, MAT fellow, Roger Law. So I get inspiration from this court um, by Simon uh, Simon Chapman. And he mentioned that in this age of mechanical and electronic production and reproduction, it would be naive to reject the notion of non-human narrative agency. For instance, a story constructed through algorithmic process or as a result of multiple voices constructing together in real time. 
So I did several um, projects um, that really celebrate um, the collaborative works between the non-human narrators and artists' original voice and also audience real-time feedback. And one of them is Tangjie series. And, and it's in collaboration with my um, uh, uh, collaborator, Jun Hao Ren, and he is also from UCSD. And this work it has, actually has two parts. The first part is the virtual reality experience. The second part is an interactive art installation. This work is coming from a simple question. So the humans and machines are in constant conversations. Humans start the dialogue by using programming language that will be compiled to binary digits that machines can interpret. However, intelligent machines, they are not only observers of the world. They also make their own decisions. So I'm wondering if AI indicates human beings to create a symbolic system to communicate based on their own understanding of the universe and start to actively interact with us. How will this recontextualize our coexistence in this intertwined human machine reality? My inspiration is from an uh, uh, Asian Chinese legendary historian. He has been widely considered as the person who invented Chinese characters based on the characteristics of everything on the earth. Uh, we get inspiration from Chinese character. It's not just because some Chinese are reading Chinese and appreciate the aesthetic, the beauty of those characters. It's also because it's one of the oldest local graphic system. So it's actually created based on appearance of the real world objects. For example, if you look at the top right corner, the first one is chicken, the second one is song, the third one is moon, and this one is bamboo. It does have a deep connections with appearance and the characteristic of the real world objects. That's the reason uh, we choose this as an inspiration. And we, we are wondering if we can create an AI system that observes the surroundings, just like the historian did thousand years ago in real time and reconstruct the real world imagery as a cluster of new symbols. How would this uh, recontextualize our coexistence between humans and machines? So the first step of this project is uh, intelligent system design. And we use unsupervised learning technique to model Chinese character strokes. And we uh, the data sets is from open source hands of data over 9,000 Chinese characters. And the learned model is then used to create novel characters based on the images. As you can see um, from this uh, image, it's actually used edge detection uh, to transform the uh, real time uh, live streaming image to the, uh, uh, the new style and then divided this image into several patches. It went through the generated model and reconstruct those patches using the new symbols. And noticeable that those new symbols are not Chinese characters. They are pseudo Chinese characters. They, uh, they only follow the aesthetic of Chinese character, but they don't have, convey any meanings. So this is the first step of the um, system design result demo. So when I wave my hands in front of the camera, I have those kind of new symbols generated in real time. And because as I mentioned, I really uh, want to emphasize the collaborative manner between the audiences, the artistic original voice, and also machines creation. So I did not use the machines output as our presentation. Uh, however, we did a lot of like image, image processing layers under the creation of my machines and trying to create an aesthetic of Chinese calligraphy. So the first version is actually just um, virtual reality space with the in-flight particles floating around the immersions and with the real-time generated uh, pseudo-Chinese character floating in the space. And however, we further developed this project by incorporate another model into the system. It's because we want to, um, because originally the work is more like a visual celebration of the aesthetic. Um, of the creation between the machines and audience and human beings. However, we want to emphasize on the semantic part in the context of language and symbols. So that's the reason we incorporate the second model, uh, the portrait model dance cap. And the dance cap is generating the descriptive sentence of the surroundings in real time. Uh, it not only attach the meanings to those pseudo Chinese characters, it also engage the audiences who do not speak Mandarin than Chinese or Chinese. Uh, and this is the installation view. So basically we have a camera observing the surroundings and uh, then generating the two visualizations in real time based on its observation and interpretation of surroundings. 
So here is the um, uh, demo, and then uh, I'm gonna play the demo one second. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna quickly explain the details be behind the, those two visualizations. Um, the firstly, the first visualization is actually using the live streaming image pixels to write in the new symbols and the gestures and also the writing gestures and also the tonality of those um, uh, visuals is determined by the live streaming data RGBA channels. And uh, my visual inspiration from William de Kooning, abstract expressionism, and also from uh, Shinoda Taco by combining the ink wash painting with the abstract expressionism. And this is one of the demos. So when I'm with my hands in front of the camera, you can see the landscape of the image data is actually writing the new symbols in real time. And the second visualization is created by the Putrin model desk cap. And um, it's actually inspired by the 20th century concrete poetry by arranging the text typographically to convey meanings. And it's also com uh, combined with the pictorial fragments. The composition is ever changing based on the RGBA channels of the live streaming data. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it makes the um, interactive installation really difficult because of the uh, social distance. Um, so we also create a special edition for this work. And by release the call for content online, and we collect 24 footages from 12 different countries during this pandemic. And we fed those um, footages into our systems and create those two visualizations uh, as a poetry book. So the sound part is still under development, but you can see um, the system, the Tangjie is actually looking at the footages submitted by uh, different people and then generating the new symbols. And it's also generating the descriptive sentence by attaching the meanings to those pseudo Chinese characters. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, why, thank you very much, uh, Wadi. Um, inspirational work. Um, if I can ask all of the uh, presenters to uh, put on their cameras, but I just wanted to finish Wadey, thank you. I remember the first day we met, I was like, who are you? Hey, you went to Cal Arts, I did too. And that was, that was it. I'm like, okay, she's cool. And um, I'm really happy. So thank you everyone for coming. I guess, uh, Part of the reason why I called you guys here is that you guys are, have been important in my life, but I've actually seen you guys 
affect change in your communities as thought leaders, as artists, and as educators. So um, I wanted to actually have a discussion. So I wanna open to the floor to um, any of you presenters to see if you wanted to ask each other questions before we go into something very deep. But uh, today's objective is to have a real dialogue uh, and you guys presented very compelling work. So um, who wants to start? I think I'll ask a question. You know, there, first of all, everyone, this was this was really such an incredible um, morning for me. Uh, for some of you also who are in on the Pacific Standard Time, I know we have viewers from all over the world watching. But uh, this was really an important time for me to wake up with uh, in with moments of um, of learning and inspiration and um, questions and curiosity and that's what all of you have brought out and a lot of you are approaching things in really different ways but with with centered around inquiry um, everything has inquiry at the center and I think that's really important um, I I want to um, ask um, uh, um, Graham uh, and Haru uh, I'm gonna start with you since you had presented uh, relatively early on, you, you, you said something that, that I actually still think about um, over this last hour, which was that we, uh, do we know what intelligence is? And I, 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 re, I really been thinking about that over the, um, the time that we've been together. I don't know. And this idea of creating this um, way of using the, an AI system that actually just allows it to go in its own direction without really trying to prescribe it something or define it as something, I think it's really important. And I want to just hear more about that. And um, what, um, you know, do you see anything happening with that? Or, or what, what, how should we be thinking about that further? Um, I, I can, um, yeah, I will begin to think. Yes, I'll, I think we are in the interesting um, period that uh, we can make things while we don't know enough. And then uh, also we are in the, the period that um, that obvious things um, are becoming like not, uh, not obvious anymore. So I would say like many things about what is life, what is intelligence, or like a far we, what is virtual, uh, like, I mean, the physical space or physical realities versus virtual realities. I think um, in those old questions, um, they were a lot um, easier to answer. Like if we kind of go, go back to like a, a few hundred years ago, but um, it kind of, when it comes to our time, because the reason I think is because our perception gets, um, um, like it, it, it expands it gets uh, larger and deeper. So we know more basically in the micro level and macro level. And then, and then we found out that mo most of the distinctive uh, words and uh, the lines in between, there are a lot more things. So it's, it's more, it's, it becomes more difficult to define things. And then we could realize that uh, why like we know, we get to know more and why like we can make things more, but um, kind of meanwhile, we also get to know that um, how much like, we don't know. I think that's really important part about where we are ignoring. Because um, I'm, uh, I'm what I'm concerning is that um, we are not doing like because we get to know more, and then we we uh, there are like some things we can do, maybe as an individual, as um, as a collective uh, community. But definitely we are not doing what we can do because the short span um, goals. So we kind of make the framework. Like for this, as I said, I like this analogy, uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, the, the story that um, it's from the Buddhism that where, where like when we need to see the moon, the people don't like to see the moon, but instead like they like to see the, the tip or just fingertips to point out the moon. And then I think we, I think that's the way we need to endeavor. And then I think there is a value that we have this discussion as a community that it's not the, the fingertip. We need to see the moon, like individually, collectively. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 
Do yeah, you want to add something? No, I, I yeah, that, that that's exactly it. And it, as much as we we've learned how much we know, some, sometimes that's that's that, that's the risk of uh, feeling overconfident, right? Um, there, there was a presentation that, that we attended when we were grad students where uh, an engineering professor came and he says, guys, guys, don't do anything complicated. Don't do anything complicated. Just go for the low hanging fruit. That's all you need. And then, you know, you go for the low hanging fruit, you'll get, it'll be easy. It'll be easy. And, I, you know, something in me was just like turning inside of like, how, there's something really, really wrong with this. And it, it's, there's, there's something that is happening to the world where every connection is being optimized, every path is being made more efficient. And the, the bulk of AI at the moment is pushing in that direction. It's like optimize, optimize to solve this problem, to solve this problem, as if we know what we're really looking for, as if we really know what is needed. Um, and that's, that's what we were talking about when we were saying about being afraid of a, fu a future that's no longer a future because it's already been paid by the past, because it's already been assumed what the, the answer should be. There was something that Aline said that I thought was beautiful, where uh, just a turn of phrase of negotiating a balance. And that conversation, that, that, that level of communication is, is something that's it's so difficult for us to articulate, so difficult to put into um, uh, symbolic terms because it doesn't have hard edges. It, doesn't have, it, it isn't containable. It isn't a quantity that we can easily measure and, and, and exchange. Um, but it's so important. It's like um, if, if we're going to make a healthy environment, it should be a forest, not a plantation is another way of thinking of it, right? It's a plantation gives you a greater yield, it's more optimized, but there's so much work that has to be put in to maintain that plantation. And there's so little, uh, it only serves that one purpose. And, you know, we don't want to live there, we want to live in the forest. Sorry. Okay. Hopefully that kind of fleshes out. I don't know if you wanted something more uh, technical or something, but. Uh, no, that's that was perfect that was perfect i mean i i i expect no um uh, no straight answers here <laughs> you know there the, this is this is you know the complexity of of everyone's work is, is is extremely clear and and that you know this is really um a, a, a about where your research is in that exploration and how um a lot of the we're always seeking answers immediately and i don't think that's something that we can we can even um grasp at that moment i mean there's always this solution oriented um um yeah. we're always trying to innovate on a solution but it's not always right there at that moment and a lot of times it it really is about slowing that process down and it's about that inquiry and it's about um letting that organicness go and that is um uh uh really important and it's where artists themselves can look at the, the space in, in in multiple dimensions that are not available in in this in a really rigid form and i think all of you have really demonstrated that today uh, really, if, oh sorry go on oh i was just going to add something about this um and i i think as artists our role is not to actually create the solutions right i think our power is like um, seeing the problem maybe in a different way or asking a right question or presenting or like embodying that question in a certain way that moves people uh, instead of like coming up here like this I solved this problem this is the solution that's not what we're here for we're more like hey like can we think of this problem this way and um, you know I don't know just present it this way and create an experience around this and pose a, a certain question and so forth and I think this is also like a part of Harwin Graham's work. We were talking about intelligence earlier uh, and their work is so much about uh, perhaps the intelligence in a very non-human centric way, right? Like, um, I don't know if I'm correct in saying this, but um, everything you're saying is like, um, has those connotations about, you know, let's get out, of, uh, get out of ourselves and not place ourselves in the center of all this. Anyway, that's all I want to say for now. Uh, uh, thank you, Haru and uh, Graham and Shalen. Hannah, uh, Wadey, Arlene, do you guys want to uh, chime in about a vision for change in the arts design and sciences or what is on your mind?
I think that one vision within the arts and sciences is really what can we do as artists that, um, and how can we look at technology that isn't kind of consumerist driven. So a lot of the work that we, the technology that we interact with is designed to be addictive and designed to really um, not, not to better our mental health, but to keep us on these platforms as much as possible. So in creating art, how can we design art that really questions those interactions and can create meaningful and um, interactions that create emotive experiences instead of uh, addictive ones? Um. I think for me, uh, technology somehow create that, that kind of alienation. So I was always trying to concern the system design and also uh, the sanctions inside of my uh, art practices. And I was trying to incorporate um, artistic original voice, such as using the cultural representations or those kind of things to attach um, those meanings to um, element eliminate those kind of alienations in some ways. And also by creating uh, the uh, real-time interactions between the audiences and to, um, to engage the audience in different ways in the meaning creation process. Aline, do you have something to say? Yeah, going back to what, uh, very much what Hannah was saying, I think there's really something about showing a different use of technology that isn't focused on efficiency and on like taking us, taking our attention out of ourselves um, and just um, going back to just this very natural um, state of mind that we're born with, which is just being curious and feeling like exploring rather um, than um, just going on to like yeah time efficiency and uh, and well money efficiency and so on um, so there is definitely uh, something to uh, to do in creating experiences that uh, just get people to interact with technology um, in uh, to create experiences that just are meaningful to them um, rather than trying um, to um, create uh, any sort of uh, wealth that it has nothing to do with individuals. Um, so, so yeah, very much uh, agreeing with Hannah there. Uh, I wanted to briefly say um, uh, we have a few guests on the um, the interweb social media that are watching. So, uh, Professor Novak from the director of the Trans Lab said hi to everyone. So he wanted to make sure that you guys know uh, Dr. Joanne Kuchamarin and Professor Pelhan are watching. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you, you guys. I guess I wanted to say that um, now that I think we're kind of in the middle and we're comfortable with each other, what are the things that I guess you guys uh, in the field, what do, you think, uh, what do you think are obstacles for us to reach our true potential as artists and researchers? And what, how do you, if you could, how would you reorganize our practice, our discipline, and basically our society so that we can make change. Um, we have climate change, we have equity problems, we have economic problems, we have the pandemic. What can we do as artists and researchers? Uh, take it away, anyone. Uh, can we, can I try? The thought experiment that we were we were chatting about a few days ago. Um, there's, um, you know, the, the ancient Greek school of thought uh, had this kind of triumvirate of, uh, of, of things to aim for, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And, um, you know, suddenly it occurred to me, this is like the RGB, you know, but it's not the only three uh, ways you could arrange the color wheel, right? You've got your cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, so can you rotate that space and think what sits between the good and the true, what sits between the true and the beautiful and, and, and so forth. And we're, actually, what made me think of this was Danielle when she was um, talking about 
getting her position by being honest. And honesty is one of the things that I would put in that triumvirate. Um, there's a distinct lack of uh, importance of honesty uh, at the moment. Um, and I, I, I don't know for the others, maybe vibrance, maybe diversity, maybe grace, maybe, maybe um, har harmony, uh, maybe balance. Um, I don't, I, I, maybe it's a, a, a question that um, the, the people might have a response to. Well, uh, I want to add a little bit. Oh, yeah, sure. I want to add a little bit because um, I think I need more time to uh, structure the ideas. But <laughs> I think that um, it's time, like, I think we already started the paradigm shift, that um, the paradigm shift did not focus on objects, um, and but the, the focus on the interrelations, the subtle like interdependence, um, so they recognize as uh, um, as a system, as a community, and then it's not like uh, focusing on to the visible centers, but the um, the detailed view. I mean, like uh, Solen and Hannah's works, that you need to go closer and then to see closer view. Then you will see a lot more around there. Like there is a vast space um, at the the marginal and boundaries and membranes, and they are not the end of the world, but there are the, the it's the, the place where to um, share information that grow and a new new things are, um, are uh, starting to happen. Uh, anyway, the, when um, the, the paradigm shift is, uh, I think it's really uh, important. Otherwise, if we don't um, like really adapt to this paradigm shift and then get out of from the fear of the unknown, um, then I think we will uh, we will lose the control over because again, like we can do a lot more things at the contemporary um, in media arts or like uh, now, like it's not only the media arts that, that which uh, who are using this computation and expression, the sensory expression, and um, like the, everybody's using this convergence, and then there can be a divergence, transvergence part. Um, um, but um, that um, if we don't change our ideas, then basically we we just uh, not using what we can do. So we uh, that I think there is a reason that we know more and deeper. And then with that, and then that we now recognize that the problem are all connected. It's, it's more, uh, it's more complex, but they, but they are collective. So I think if we, if we focus on the really the problem, realm, like we just can see the problem themselves, then I think we can we can change it, but we don't do that. We don't do that. We stay um, at the, the previous. And then because of, there are so many information, there are so many noise, I just uh, the overwhelms by this infinite quantity that we give up and we give up. And then e uh, we are going to more like easy, easy way. It's like we want to hear the like um, easy framework to follow. And I think that's, that's a long thing. I just wanted to thank you, Haro and Graham. Um, there's a uh... That was really beautiful. Um, uh, Professor Novak said, thank you, uh, Graham. <laughs> uh, this question is for Shalene and Hannah, because I think that uh, I have been a staunch supporter of, um, I would say, uh, female artists. And I would say uh, briefly, my mother was not allowed to go to art school when she was younger. It was a different age and a different time. She studied mathematics and physics. She was a natural at it, but uh, she was told that uh, it was a man's field. And I have problems with that. I have problems with a lot of stuff like that. So I think with Sholen and Hannah, and also with Wadey and Aline, what do you guys see that will make this change that we can have true equity and kind of this, uh, this new power structure where we share and we also evolve our culture. So Shalen and Hannah, you start. I, I'm gonna be very honest. I didn't quite understand the question. Uh, maybe can you reframe it or say it again? Sorry, oh yeah, really well, well basically you guys do, you, you guys highlighted a certain type of, um, I would say injustice. Mm -hmm. And as women artists, uh, you know, there's an undue responsibility. It seems to me, in my opinion, there was a bias. You mm -hmm. guys are now leading. You guys have made a work. 
and there is a dialogue out there that you're a part of, what do you think can make this better? Is it more honesty? Is it more arts about this topic? What can you do as a leading female artist about this? Oh, I'm just going to brainstorm here. I think the problem isn't like uh, about the uh, uh, female artists. Maybe the problem is more about female artists in media arts or female artists dealing with technology. It's definitely um, a small uh, group of people and uh, it is re reflected in institutions and, and so forth. I think the climate is beginning to change. Uh, so I think there's hope. Uh, but um, yeah, the, there's definitely... Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, there have been times that I felt like a minority in the environments that I've been in. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know what the answer would that be like for, um, I mean, for instance, like, yeah, MAT is doing this amazing thing, the um, alliance of women in, in media arts and technology or media arts and sciences, as it has changed, I suppose. Uh, organizations like this that support uh, specifically female researchers and female artists are, um, uh, and I want to quote here, uh, uh, refer to Lena Matthew here and, and Joanne, um, and, and Hannah also worked on this uh, organization. Uh, things like that are uh, amazing. They're very, very helpful, and uh, they should be more. That's all I have to say. I think the one kind of continuation of this is um, I think that there's a history of women in performance art and a history of women doing performance work. And I think that the, that the and, and also queer and um, uh, not just women, but non-binary people, people, um, Yeah, so queer art as well in performance and the relationship of the body in that work. And I think that there, that, that has also been underrepresented and there's a clear relationship though between media arts and performance work is that it's, it's harder to exhibit, it's more temporary. There's um, a relationship between the technology and the immediacy and the now. Um, but when I've looked at the history of media arts, particularly robotic media arts, there's, there is a, a, a lack of representation in robotic performance work among um, women and um, non-white cis male uh, artists. Um, so I think it's really important to, to look at those, but also to look back in history and to see who's talking and who's talking about artwork and who's promoting the artwork. If we have media that is being led by white men that are just being, that are just highlighting white men's work, then you have this kind of recursive cycle of that there are artists who were doing work, they're just not work that was being exhibited and not work that's being spoken about. I just want to intercept, intercept and say something like, uh, not to give myself credit, but I do do this, like when I'm teaching a class uh, on media arts or whatever, like I really pay very good attention to kind of rewrite that history or like bring forth the works of female artists in history and, and today as best as I can so that uh, my students are like familiar with them more, even if they're like maybe not as prominently uh, presented uh, as, as their male counterparts before, but it's very important as educators to uh, bring forth the works of uh, female artists and researchers. Um, yeah. And I agree with everything Hannah said. Yeah, building on what Shalon says, I know this is like kind of off topic, but my mother is a history teacher and she talks about how when she teaches, she wants to teach about female scientists and female artists, not just because it kind of like kills two birds with one stone in that way. If someone asks about, talk about um, women in, you know, the Renaissance, if you have a history of knowledge of female artists from the Renaissance, you can talk about those. But then if you also are asked, talk about 
Renaissance artists, well, you have this history of, of Renaissance artists that you can talk about who are women. So, you know, by, you know, talking about diverse artists, diverse scientists, we can both learn about the, the history of, of the people who we don't normally talk about, but we can also talk about that specific field as well. Well, I, I, I think before we move on, uh, Danielle had a, uh, uh, wanted to say something, but just before that, I know Weidi, you said that you grew up close to Tonji University. So I wanted to, before I forget, for you to comment, and then also for uh, Aline, if you could also comment about uh, history of performance and architecture uh, in women and what inspired you to make your work. But uh, take it away, Danielle. Uh, you're muted. Sorry, rookie, rookie uh, call there. Uh, so uh, I'll just be brief on this. I just want to. I just want to add on to to what was mentioned. Um, it, it, it's also not just about uh, showing more women, but it's also about recognizing that women were actually part of the the history of creating technology. They were just written out of all the literature and all the books and not given all the credit. Uh, I really want to give it a lot of credit to these um, um, these Wikipedia thons that are writing women back into history. Um, that is a really good way to do that. I think those have been fantastic. Um, there's also um, over the last two days there was an archiving the Black Web conference. Um, uh, women and um, uh, and and people of color, including women of color, uh, Black and Indigenous women, have been part of the history of technology and have not been given any credit for it. And I think that's really important to recognize. And uh, that has also really created a way that, uh, 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 wh why we haven't seen more women and people of color come into these fields is because one is the, the, the working environments were not comfortable, but there was no written examples or shared examples of that. Um, so I think mentorship is really critical in that space. Also recognizing that uh, that people of, um, with disabilities and technology, um, the history of technology is also the history of disability. And that when we look at a lot of the technologies that we've been built on over the over the decades, over the years, these also were about creating um, technology for access for disability access. And that has also not been so um, exemplified in that history. And I will say, and I'll just put a plug in for Leonardo's new Cryptech incubator, which is now accepting calls for proposals um, or calls for inquiry rather than proposals uh, about allowing that space to happen, for that innovation to happen. Uh, and it's important that, um, that women, uh, 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 disability, um, technologists and artists with disabilities come into play, uh, um, black and brown, uh, artists come in and help develop this technology from the onset, uh, not just as cr content creators, but as the developers of the actual technology that we're using. Um, this is really going to start to, we're starting, we will start to see a shift um, and also recognize those who have been part of that past as well. I think that's really essential. As you talk about those, give those examples in your presentation, cite those in your literature, um, encourage your students not just to um, reference the, the, um, the cis white males that have been over and over again um, referenced in all of their papers and recreations, but really encourage them to look on who else was part of that team and how do you actually um, um, bring those, those folks forward. So I wanna pass it over to Wadey. Um, and that's what that's all I'll mention. All right, Wadey. Thank you very much, Danielle. But Wadey, you grew up close to Tonchi University. What's going on there? Oh, I um actually not growing up close to the Tonchi University. Mm -hmm. I'm growing up in the city near Shanghai. It's uh, pretty near Suzhou. Um, and I think the question is pretty tough. And I actually went through those fires. Um in the recent years and I deeply understand the pain. And I think um, probably education pro provides a hope 
because um, I was being educated in Cal Arts and it's an interdisciplinary art school and any kind of art practices and um, around any kind of topics is being encouraged and um, the mentors are super supportive. Uh, for, for example, when I want to uh, express my identity, uh, cultural identity, my mentor is really supportive and encourage me to do that. And I think, um, so for example, some of the feminism uh, artists um, in Cal Arts also being encouraged to express their own voice and using their own aesthetics or uh, different ways of practice. So I think um, definitely education provides a hope and I agree with uh, Sholan uh, said that brings up uh, the examples from underrepresented artists. And I also agree with that. Uh, in, in the class I'm currently teaching, I always bring up the critique and theory based uh, discussion from not only from the uh, iconic artists in the Western um, art canon and also from underrepresented art, artist group. And I also think uh, the AWMIT platform is uh, those kind of conference features uh, women artists work is very helpful and I also joined one of the conference uh, last the uh, 2019 2020 and I think um, it's a great conference and everybody uh, shared their opinions and it's a great community yeah thank you uh, uh, thank you Wadi uh, Aline uh, your thoughts yeah I think loads of things have been said but I think one interesting point is just that people who get in media arts like tend to come from all sorts of horizons. So it's not only about um, getting, uh, you know, young girls inspired to become media artists, but it's really just to make them feel empowered to become anything. Because if you think about like all the different journeys we all had, um, I didn't know I would land there. You know, I started with spatial design. I st started with commercial spaces. And then slowly, um, it just uh, I just found my way. Um, so I think it's really about um, just uh, making kids feel and uh, and yes, there's girls, but there's also black kids. And you know, I come from like a very small island where um, you know art is not much of a thing really. Uh, when I tell what I say here, um, people just like yeah, they have no idea. Um, they think I've just gone crazy. Um, but um, the um, it's it's really just about um, providing. Um, is it experiences? Is it like I, I don't know what it is. Like it's education, but maybe there is something to do um, that is um, that that is out of the classroom because the like our educational system isn't quite like fit for that but that just allows kids to project themselves and imagine what a complete different life could be. Because, um, you know, um, if you're not born in a big city, um, then the, the, the shift is even so much bigger to make um, from being like grown in a, on a tiny island in the countryside to being a media artist in Los Angeles, you know, like there's just um, things to do for kids to be able to just imagine lives and just think it's possible. Um, so they can just jump for it and go for it. Uh, thank, thank you, Aline. Um, I guess we're, um, we have a little bit more time, but I just wanted to say that, you know, this is a unique moment for all of us. I have, you guys have inspired me in different ways and at different times. Uh, what is really, um, what are your thoughts right now in your work? Like what inspires you? What, what do you think can, make a difference to someone who isn't a part of the media arts or architecture that you can share that will make them overcome their circumstances, economic or just where they are in life. And uh, before we end, I, I just wanted to have Danielle maybe share a little bit of uh, the future of Leonardo and how we can maybe come together as a community. But uh, let me lead with Haru and Graham. I, you know, I've met their, their wonderful, beautiful daughter and their family in Guangzhou. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a beautiful time, two weeks in Korea before the pandemic and uh, the world changed. So what can we do as leaders? So take it away, Graham, Graham and Haru. I, um, I think it was a not easy um, 
easy uh, question to answer, but um, I found uh, quite a um, big inspiration from Ellen's um, talk. I think it's really important that you see it. And then it, because the, the, that I think that the value of the media art is there because the, the many things, this combination of computation and politics or the like many things which are contradictory could kind of merge together and then uh, combine together with multiple layers and uh, all like different components into one of the entity as a world or as a living system. And it becomes us, one of us. Um, that I think that to, to see it, I think that is like, uh, I will also now it's been uh, we we form our um, like the, this artificial nature group um, in 2007, and then now we are hearing from people that we met before, and they said like I I started this I made this like I kind of came to this field because we met you like somewhere we saw your work or like we uh, we heard your talk and then I decided to do it and then made it and then their works were amazing and then like it was something we couldn't expect and then they didn't expect and then also yeah it's really like when you journey then um, if it's an easy journey then you can see you can enjoy everything but if it's a difficult journey then many many times in the deep mountain you don't see the next step and then you don't know where you are only what you can do is just moving on to to just the next step and then suddenly you see at the, the kind of top of the one mountain and then and then see that there are so many other mountains so again like i think that we should make the forest and then about this equity and diversity and both values all together we need to connect each other but not as like this kind of best network that to connect to, to all at once i think we should be against to that because that none, none of um, um, deep thoughts could survive into that structure. So we need to recognize the structure. And then um, the in forest, there are so many diverse things. And then we know that they connect each other, but they connect um, based on the different speciations. But the, between speciations, they also make the big connections. And then it's just again, okay, there are so many connections. And I hope that we can make in media arts into, into that. And then we, do it and then and it's a, it's a really powerful um, thing that we can show the work and then and then before I didn't trust like artists talk because I think the artists <laughs> talk through the, the artworks not by <laughs> like, like like this but um, I think still like I appreciated this opportunity to to express and then to share ideas and then through this I think that uh, that we can make some changes. So don't trust us, trust yourself. Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> Let's make a forest connection. <laughs> yeah. well, 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 thank you. Um, uh, Graham, do you, do you have any words or books or things that you can inspire people for change? Like, I know you're an avid reader and, uh, you know, you're an incredible thinker. Like, what, what, what can you leave us with? Um, yesterday I was reading some Heinz von Forster that was written in 1971, I think it was. And the problem, he was diagnosing uh, the problems of America today. Um, and it sounds like America today. Um, I, I really recommend you go, go and read it. It's, it's um, um, the perception of change and change of perception. Really great little uh, article. Thank you, um, Graham and Haru. Um, I, I go to Shalen and Hannah. Uh, Shalen, uh, do you have any final thoughts or books, music? I know that you're a musician. I love, I love seeing you play the drums, but uh, take it away, Shalen. Oh, um, I don't know what I want to say for final, but I think, okay, this is what I want to say. I think um, Part of the problem for me is that uh, media arts is still like marginalized to a degree. It's not as like commonly, um, let's say like, we're still talking amongst ourselves. And then yes, we do community outreach reaches, but then I wish it would be even more. Um, I think the part of the problem of, oh, this is because it resists commercialization to a degree, uh, what we do, because it's all like, again, it's all based in the 1960s process art, conceptual art, and so forth, because uh, it's based on, yeah, like, 
it's temporal it's it's behavioral it's all these things that that resist commercialization commercialization there are commercial uh media arts but uh we perhaps are not in that anyway so uh, to me like the biggest problem is to reach a, a wider audience with my work this is what i really want to do i want people to uh, to see my work more i mean i want to show my work and and engage in a uh, um, in a d discussion uh, and, you know, grow on from there. And I want to see more work. And, and, and I don't know what the solution to that is, honestly. Um, but one thing that Hannah and I thought of doing, and uh, I, I, I cannot take credit for this. I recently had a talk at York University where uh, Graham is. And uh, one of the uh, members in the audience has suggested, hey, have you guys ever heard of uh, no, ha have you guys thought of like uh, making Cacophony Choir a virtual experience by inviting actual uh, sexual assault survivors and like have them represented with avatars like in the like the current work, but like have have them in there and create a community uh, um, a performance or a community activity where where people, uh, you know, we create this version of it where people are there, maybe it's cathartic for them or, or whatnot. And uh, um, a different rendition of the piece, if you will. And I thought that was a great idea, for instance. And I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, maybe Graham would remember the name of the person. I don't remember. I was like, that's a great idea. And, and I started thinking about that is in how to engage more people, how to reach more people, like work with organizations and community outreaches and and not to share our art, but also yeah, share our art, our vision and reach those people, really. I mean, that's that's what I ultimately do this really is to um, connect with people. That's all I want to say. Uh, thank you, uh, Sholen. Uh, Hannah, uh, do you want to share uh, uh, just just uh, non-disclosure? Uh, Hannah and I worked for a few years closely together, but she is a fascinating, very, um, I would say literate and wonderfully uh, gifted person. And I, I really enjoy speaking with her. And I miss that she's somewhere else teaching, but her students must love her. So take it away, Hannah. Um, yeah. Uh, closing. Um, I think that it's really important to, to think about process and think about making and think about how our our work can be part of that conversation. I am really inspired by all the work that we've seen today and thinking about what directions that work can go. So it was really, it's really great to be a part of this. Uh, just one thing, and I don't know if uh, Hannah wants to do a plug, but she had a really good radio show about science fiction. And just before before we move on, uh, Hannah, can you can you can you say a little bit about why science fiction and why radio and how did that help your work? Yeah, so that was a really great. Um, you know, I spent a year working on a radio show in which I read short stories by um, female writers from the '40s, '50s, and early 60s, uh, that was out of copyright and looking at different perspectives um, and also incorporating um, audio and electronic music that was being created during that same period of time and trying to both elevate these, these female voices and these female stories. And, and even since I no longer practice in that, I spend a lot of time still focused on reading science fiction by female authors um, for example, I guess just recently I read a, a book called My Real Children about, um, about a woman and her experience starting in, uh, you know, maybe in the 40s to the present about her life and um, how, you know, kind of all the science fiction type stuff was happening to people around her and to the world around her, but it was mostly just about her and her life and her children. Um, and seeing that perspective and seeing that perspective 
from not the person who all the action is happening to, but just the everyday person and how that affects their life, I thought was really meaningful. So it's a piece uh, of media I've consumed recently. No, I just, uh, if you have not had a chance, you should listen to her. I think you have the archives of your radio show on your website, correct? Yeah, so I would recommend that uh, who, I'm a fan of Hannah, I have to say, I'm a fan of all of you, but Hannah, especially, we had some good talks and I really appreciate her intelligence uh, and her will. And um, I think now we're gonna move on to, I would say, uh, Weighty, do you have any final thoughts? Like what books or media do you consume to help inspire your viewers? Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me today uh, in this great panel. And I got a lot of inspiration from um, those uh, intriguing uh, presentations. And for final words, I think um, I got inspiration from Professor Novak uh, because in the first year uh, in MAT, I worked close uh, with TransLab and um, he mentioned that uh, the new media art projects I created in the uh, before is more like the flowers on the trees. And however, we need to look back into the rise from the roots on the ground. So I think it's really interesting to um, looking back um, to the history and the theory to knowing where all those technological aspects coming from and to reveal the hidden like structures behind those technologies. And also to build a structure that combines um, the rational and the magical you know, uh, in your uh, in the unique voices. So I think that's something I want to bring up. And for the a uh, book I'm currently reading is actually uh, uh, the Manuel de Landa's, it, it's just on the hand, and Assembler's Theory, because uh, English is my uh, second language and uh, my reading pace is really slow. And it's also from the uh, uh, psychological field. So um, I'm still reading this book and trying to get uh, to know deeply about those kind of elements mentioned in this book. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wadey. Um, before we move on, uh, Professor Novak wanted to say thank you. And uh, But uh, before that, I wanted to say that we are going to have a conference. I think it's a few weeks and maybe someone from Digital Futures can come in at the end, but uh, I think we might have Manuel Delanda. I'm not sure, but fingers crossed. Uh, and I think Zizek is also a part of it as well, fingers crossed. So uh, that would be fun to have. And we would love to have you and part of the free workshops, please invite your students and our, our community. But uh, Elaine, take it away. Do you have final thoughts? What books, what inspires you, movements, art? Yeah, um, yeah, I just wanted to say like, a big part of my work has started with like reading. I was reading a book called The Machine Stops by um, Foster and which is uh, a short uh, science fiction novel as well. And going through this whole pandemic. So the story is you can't live on the surface of earth anymore. And everyone is living in isolation in small cells. And so they're not moving anymore. You have no physical contact. There's no touch. There's no, uh, so you're completely like cut off from your body sensations. Um, and um, this whole situation we've been living for more than a year um, really just like brought me back to this and, um, and just highlighted uh, when you see the mental state of everybody now, uh, it just really uh, makes you realize that, um, that this, there is actually a great quote in that book, which is man is the measure. You just, you need to move and you need to see people physically and you need, you need to use all your senses and, um, and yeah, it just made, um, brought, uh, uh, comforted uh, the, the um, I guess, the relevance of my work and just we need um, to, um, to make technology uh, closer to our, our bodies and the complete opposite of, and create experiences that are the complete opposite of what we've been um, living for more than a year now. Um, so yeah, that would be my thought. Well, thank you, Aline, for that. Um, I, I would say that um, when I saw your work and spoke with you, um, I have a, we have a colleague, I think uh, people from MAT named Tim Wood, and he just uh, graduated with his doctorate. Now is at US um, UCSD. Uh, he danced for pretty much most of the time I was there. 
And so when I saw your work, I was dancing with those agents and uh, it was very poetic, very playful at a time where there's so much depression and suffering and death. Um, and that's a bummer to say, but you know, it seems like we're all privileged to even make art and to teach and to do research. So thank you, Elaine. Uh, Danielle, I think uh, I, I, what I would say is Danielle has inspired me to, to really reach out to the community of Leonardo and art and science, but I've also challenged uh, Danielle and the powers that be to say, how are we gonna change the mess that we're in? And is Leonardo this institution an agent of change? And I know Digital Futures World and Neil Leach and his collaborators, that's what we're doing. So take it away, Danielle, tell us what's going on with Leonardo and what can we do? Well, thank you. And, and uh, I'm very inspired by everyone on this call and I'm really eager to work with everyone in, in the room. And some of you I've, I've, I've met before and I'm really interested in, in, in finding pathways to make this happen. Um, so first I wanna also thank Gustavo for really pushing the me and the organization uh, to really make sure that we are, uh, focus on bringing everybody into the community and having a community first approach. And that's really uh, quite a bit of what we do. I mean, our, our vision as an organization is to activate creativity, to push the boundaries of today and unleash the possibilities of tomorrow. And all of you are doing that. And uh, I don't want to take up too much more time because I know that we're, we're, we're getting close to the hour, but one of the ways that we are approaching this is looking at how we can transform systems and how we can amplify net networks and how we can incubate ideas. And that really um, starts internally with ourselves and then externally. There's going to be quite a few programs and initiatives that are going to be rolling out throughout this year. But I wanted to really emphasize that uh, Leonardo is a network of networks. It is um, something that looks at uh, creativity as this power, as creativity, curiosity, compassion, and all of the uh, areas that really about how you as creators are connecting and amplifying the work that you do to create impact throughout the world in, their, in your own and unique ways. And it's our mission to really help foster that and to center that and to create the structures around it to make that happen. So we work with the full cycle creative engine to really make sure that your work is as empowered as possible. And so I'm creating that invitation. Uh, we are um, looking at how we can approach the, the UN sustainability goals, especially in this year, the creative economy to make sure that happens. Uh, really focusing on how we can support um, the, the, the work of, the, of what you're doing in the way that artists are working and, and for a new economy, for a better future, uh, for a more generative and just world for all. And I'm just going to end it on there and feel free to reach out with out to me to check out our website, leonardo.info. But this is done with you all and um, in, in, in support of really thinking and experimenting and creating for a uh, regenerative and just world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danielle, uh, for your thoughts. And I just wanted to say that hopefully Leonardo and the, the new board and also all of everyone here can see the future leaders, I think, future strong, dynamic, and willed people uh, that cannot be stopped. I'm very humbled to be here with you guys. And the only thing I can say is after this call, I'll be reading and working and hopefully scheming and planning another talk. So with that end, I invite uh, Neil Leach. Um, he is our guide and he's the, he's the person that uh, inspired me last year. I, I think he was half dead when he was organizing 24 hour talks for I think two weeks. But um, at the end of my dissertation, I just typed in and it was like, he changed my life because I realized I needed to come out of research and to focus on community building. So I wanted to introduce Neil Leach. Uh, take it away. 
<laughs> Gustavo, thank you. I mean, thanks for this session today. Um, the only responsibility that I can I can take uh, credit for was encouraging Gustavo to have this session. I, I could see that it was going. It could be amazing, um, and it has been amazing. So I just want to thank the presenters. It was truly extraordinary work, and I, I, I really amazing work. One of the best sessions we've ever had, and I hope that we can have more. And uh, and maybe we can have some workshops coming on in our Inclusive Futures um, event. That would be absolutely amazing. I mean, just to say for those of you unaware, um, last year uh, what happened with Digital Futures is that we decided to kind of go online, go online and go global, and it turned into this massive event. We had 12,000 applications, and uh, this year we, we want to make it even more inclusive. Our idea is somehow that we can use this platform to break down the walls of the classroom. Um, I mean, to, uh, and there are many kind of, I think, uh, injustices in the world. And uh, I think that a lot of people are kind of cut off from these ideas, but we, we try to use the platform to kind of break through the walls of the classroom and to open things up into new dimensions. And we're trying to do even more this time. Um, and I mean, the kind of the ideas today kind of chime with our ideas for um, inclusive futures to really embrace the, the less privileged um, communities in the world and to make to, 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 to bring educational ideas to everyone. We see education as a human right and not as a, a privilege of the rich. So that's what we're, we're planning in the summer. And um, we're, it's a very exciting time because we're putting together some astonishing range of um, a range of, of workshops, really interesting from very, very talented people from some of the most some of the most famous schools, but also including people from with, with outreach into into other domains that otherwise we wouldn't have um, have, have, have have maybe encroached uh, areas where of less less privileged um, communities. Uh, as part of that, we're also just to mention it briefly, um, since uh, Gustavo raised the name Mammals of Lander, we 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 are we are launching what we call the Digital Consortium, which is a platform for doctoral pro doctoral students primarily, but it'll be live streamed to everyone where we're going to put together two particular courses, one on performative um, uh, uh, design, um, which my colleague Philip Yuan is going to be uh, curating, bringing in people like Aki Mengers uh, um, and so on. Um, I'm doing the one on theory. Um, and we're going to kick off with Slavoj Žižek, somebody who has um, always inspired me, um, slightly crazy, but always um, uh, inc incredibly interesting. Um, and we're trying to build up from there. Sanford Quint is definitely on board, and we're working on others, uh, Mamon de Lander, and, and some, a number of uh, key female voices. I wish I could confirm their names. But one thing we're definitely going to be doing, and I, I actually got confirmation during this, the session today, and that is to, to launch um, a new theory prize. Um, uh, um, a um, Mark Cousins Memorial Prize. Mark Cousins, as many of you know, was a hugely inspirational theorist at the Architectural Association. He was my colleague there, and um, he died tragically this last year, not from COVID, but uh, it's a great loss. And Parveen Adams has um, agreed that there, there should be a Mark Cousins Memorial Prize, so we will have one. And uh, that's a way of continuing that legacy. And, and for those of you who don't know Mark, Mark was really somebody who kind of brought some incredibly interesting ideas into the kind of domain of, of architectural design. He was a very rich thinker, and I think that many of you would have, if you haven't heard him, would appreciate what he had to say. So anyway, we're in this planning stage. It's a very exciting moment, and thank you for your, your inspiration. Um, let's hope that together uh, the Digital Futures Inclusive Futures event can inspire other people uh, as much as you have. But this was really terrific work. I. Um, I'm in awe of all the artists here. And what I see actually is something something emerging, um, which is a kind of new space of creativity between different disciplines, which is, I think, incredibly exciting. It's, it's uh, not only different disciplines, but between the kind of the physical and the virtual, between the uh, artificial and the, and, the, and the intelligence and human intelligence, something very special. So I'd like to congratulate you all and thank Gustavo above all for putting this together. Um, so thank you all. Uh, thank you, Neil. And I just wanted to say before we end is Neil has a great um, series of, uh, I would say, panels from, I think it's your AI course at Florida International University. I joined it every Sunday at six, I think, or 7 a.m. And it was a bit early, but I could say that every moment was a challenge. Like I had to read, learn, and hustle every uh, every week and to be alive. So I wanted to thank Neil. He's going to, I think he's in the middle of one book being published and he's writing two more on artificial intelligence. So I can't wait to read them. And I would actually challenge both uh, Digital Futures World 
and Leonardo to find a way to work together because we need your leadership. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that would benefit. And uh, I wanna say a shout out to Lumen's Prize. I think they're still open and I see winners here. Each one of you are winners, but if you need to apply, please apply to the Lumen's Prize, encourage your students. And I wanted to say thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I would say Dr. Sholen Kirauti, Dr. Hannah Wolf, Dr. Haruji, Dr. Graham Wakefield, Wadi Zhang, who will hopefully soon to be doctor, Aline, uh, Neil Leach, uh, Danielle Sambieta, creative director of Leonardo, and myself. I, I say goodbye from Digital Futures World, and I really appreciate the, the dialogue, and I hope to see you soon. And I think Neil made a, a gesture. If you guys want to, you think you can put together a workshop in the next few weeks, I would be more than welcome to facilitate, but uh, I just can't wait to see what happens next. So thank you again, really appreciate it. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.